Good morning. Uh, I make up words for a living. That is my passion. I write a dictionary of made up words for emotions. I call the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. Um, it's a bizarre challenge um, looking for holes in the language and trying to fill them. Uh, for one, because uh, there are already so many beautiful words out there. In French, they have a, a word, l'esprit d'escalier, which means the wit of the staircase, which is when you think of the perfect reply a few hours too late when you're already standing at your front door. Uh, in German, they have a, a word, torchless panic, which means gate-closing panic, which is when you can already feel your opportunities start to slip away. Uh, and in Japanese, they have monono aware, which, uh, which means an awareness of the impermanence of things. Um, but it's also a challenge coming up with new and interesting words. Um, for one, because there are already so many uh, usernames out there and band names and the names of species of moths and characters in World of Warcraft. It's, uh, it's oddly hard to do. But despite those challenges, um, the act of definition is still a really fulfilling and uh, it's, it's a bizarrely powerful thing to do. Um, it gives you a reason to look around with fresh eyes and forces you to question why we have, uh, why we have defined the world, why we have defined the world the way we have, and uh, reminds you of the the power of words. I'll give you an example. I was I was playing around in Latin, and I, I came up with the word antilia, and I loved I just I loved the way that word sounded, um, but it turns out it was already taken. Antilia is the name of a word in. Uh, it, it, it's the name of an island in the middle of the Atlantic. It first appeared on a map in 1424. Uh, it was settled by a group of seven bishops who left Spain when the Moors invaded. Uh, and they landed there and they set up seven cities, each on their own bay, and then they burned their ships. Um, and the, the names of those seven cities, incidentally, are Aira, Antuab, Ansali, Anseseli, Ansodi, Ansoli, and Con. And they said of the island, it has been seen from afar, but disappears upon approaching it. It took us hundreds of years to shake that word out of our heads and finally take it off our maps. Hundreds of years to admit to ourselves that the island of Antilia never existed in the first place. Of course, by then it was too late. Antilia had already taken hold of us. Because we knew the word for it, we could see it, we could we described, we, we drew detailed maps of its ports and cities. We described its culture, the history of its people. There's some part of human nature that, that can't stand a blank space in the map and do, what, do what, does whatever we can to try to fill it. If it hadn't been an island, it would have been a monster, coiled and snarling in the waves. It makes you wonder what, what other parts of our lives are phantom islands, memories of a golden age that never existed, maybe? Or falling in love with people that we barely know? Or getting into fights for no reason? There's so many visions of faraway places that no longer have anything to do with the people who live there. And uh, so many first impressions of people that we never bother to check. The fact is, we still live in the, in the maps that our ancestors uh, planned out for us so long ago. Our world is defined by language and language was defined by the people who came before us. They were the ones who planted their flags in the dirt and cut up the hole into pieces and said, this means this, and that is that. Uh, we're usually so immersed in it that we don't think to question it, but sometimes you look twice at a word and um, you sound it out in your head incredulously, 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 and it, the spell breaks, and you begin to become aware of just how arbitrary it all is how hastily put together language can be. You begin to, to realize that some languages have words for art or privacy or hell, but some don't. Some languages draw a clean line between green and blue, um, while others cut up the spectrum very differently around some color that you can't see. And you begin to wonder what it means that we managed to thrive for so many generations before anyone came up with the concept of childhood or romantic love or uh, even a common standard of time cut up into hours and minutes and seconds. We may never know why our ancestors chopped up the world the way they did, why they drew some islands and not others, why they drew 
jagged borders between uh, various concepts, we'll, we'll never really know. But we still set our watches to the beat they established. And we have no choice but to navigate according, navigate according to their terms. We fight their battles. We live in their nations. We worship their gods. And we tell their stories. But there's still, I have to believe that there's still a world out there beyond what we see on the map. There's still meaning to be found in things that can't yet be put into words. For all we know, there may be undiscovered continents hidden all around us that we can't really see because we don't have the words to do it. Hidden in the gaps in our conversations, which leaves us perpetually marooned and isolated inside our own heads. There are certain moments when you look around and you see uh, you, you, you're, you're in a public place and you notice a, one stranger among many. Maybe you're standing in a crowded train and you notice a girl standing off by the window and she's having a private moment of her own. She's looking down at her phone and listening to music. She's wearing a puffy black jacket and has a, a bun of brown hair atop her head. And you notice just in a tiny little moment she gets a text and she starts to smile but then her hand flies up and just these two fingers cover her mouth like this, like she's trying to avoid looking crazy by laughing in public. And you begin to, to wonder what's going through her head. And you see her look out the window and she has that same, same static mask that we all have in public. But you can see her reflection dead on in the window. And you see how complicated it is, her eyes looking around the landscape a kind of bubbling up of joy that is then tamped down again. And you, you wonder what is going through her head. But then, of course, before you can figure out what the text was or what she was thinking, she slips away off the train and melts into the enveloping crowd full of strangers, each of them feeling something, each of them suppressing something else, and all of it a mystery. There's your island. There's your wilderness begging to be explored. It's, it's, it's crazy that we can, human, humans can colonize faraway lands that don't even exist, and yet when you look at a stranger standing on a street corner, they don't even seem human to us. You can't imagine their, their struggles, their stories. So what happens if we give that a name? I call it Sonder. Sondra is the realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own, populated by their own friends, routines, concerns, worries, and inherited craziness. An epic story that continues invisibly around you, like an anthill sprawling deep underground with elaborate passageways to thousands of other lives that you'll never know existed, in which you might appear, you might appear only once as an extra sipping coffee in the background, as a blur of traffic passing on the highway, as a lighted window at dusk. Let Sonder served as a kind of shorthand for something that we all know but we tend to forget, which is the, the world is basically infinitely vast, but our perspective of it is infinitesimally tiny. And no matter how lucky you are to see as much of the world as you can, you're still only scratching the surface of, of things. And your lived experience, no matter how central and immersive it might be, is still one of a hundred billion sideshows. I can think of no cause more urgent than the perception of humanity in the people hidden in the people that you don't know. Those on the other side of the world, those on the other side of the wall. In the people we think of as heroes or victims or villains, or superstars, they're all just human. And their perspectives are no less real than your own. So for the last few years I've been uh, trying to do my part and define my own perspective and my own experience. Uh, my goal is to highlight how bizarre it is to be alive at all and how difficult it can be to be an ordinary human being. Um, as the saying goes, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. So here are five definitions from the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows, which is soon to become a book. Five battles that we all have to fight. And the first one is time, Evanoir. That's from French. 
uh, and that is the, the wish that you could see your memories in advance. In a way, we consider ourselves as moving through time in a linear, straightforward way, but that's not actually true. We move through, the, through life the way a rower moves, facing backwards. We can see where we've been, but not where we're going. And the boat is steered by a younger version of you. It's bizarre if you think about it. The one without the experience is the one that makes those decisions. And then there's, there's Ioki, which is the tension, the anxiety of being an individual. As standing on your own, knowing that you came into this world alone, you feel your pain alone, your, your dreams are experienced alone, and it's very hard to share those with other people. And you will leave this, word, this world alone as well. And then there's Witherwill. Witherwill is uh, the burden of freedom. Knowing that you are somewhat responsible for the things that happen to you. Uh, you may be somewhat to blame, you may get some credit, but you're not really sure which. And it's kind of an unanswerable question. And so when someone says, you can do whatever you want, in a way that's kind of a stressful thing to hear. And then nocitia, which is the sense that you're not one person, but you're many different personalities, all bundled up into, under one name. It's, it's a very hard thing to be a single person, a single personality under a single name. And finally, oh. Oh. Nacien, take my word for it. Uh, there's Nacien, which is the, uh, oh, there we go. Nacien is the awareness that you can never fully know another human being, even your loved ones. It's, it's like exploring a house that's, uh, that still has locked doors in it and things locked away, and you'll never really be able to decode the entire thing. So you're always getting to know uh, the people around you. In the end, none of these words are real. Um, they're more like placeholders to fill in blank spaces on the map, marking, marking a place where further exploration is needed by people much smarter than me. Um, sketch st such sketches still have a role to play, though, if only as a, rem as a rem reminder to, to take some ownership over the terms by which you live your life. Um, and Sonder isn't quite real either, but I have to think that it's already well on its way to becoming real, at least as much as Antilia is real. In a way, these two words sort of belong together, Sonder and Antilia. Uh, one, one is a, a, a fake word for something very real, and the other is a real word for something made up. And both seek seek to describe a kind of lost world that we wish we could go to, but uh, know that we cannot. Something that we can glimpse from a distance, but that disappears upon approaching it. But it's interesting to note that in the end, we did manage to make Antilia real after all. We did that by naming thousands of islands across the Caribbean Sea, the Antilles, from Cuba to Barbados the greater and lesser Antilles. So I think it's not so crazy to imagine that what happened for Antilia could happen for Sonder, that if a new word infects enough minds, we'll have no choice but to make it real a thousand times over. And maybe then we can finally get around to defining the world in which we actually live. And maybe then we can finally feel at home here. Thank you. <laughs>